right, Trace, how we feeling today? How you doing this morning? Still morning? Yeah, still morning. Good to have you with us. My name's Aaron, and I'm uh, honored to be one of the pastors here. And the reason I say honored is because I really do feel that uh, this has become a special place for a lot of us, for a lot of people. I feel like we've worked really hard to create a culture here where we can all come here and gather together on Sunday and we can wholeheartedly pursue Jesus together without sacrificing this idea and this notion that we can actually expose. Like we can actually expose what's really happening in our lives that we don't need to hide from our bruises and our brokenness because we all have them. And I feel like we're creating a culture here where we can do both of those. I feel like we've created a culture here where we can pursue the fullness of grace and truth. And we know that there's tension there and we don't always know exactly how that should look. And from one situation to the next, it's like, how do we, how do we approach that? And we know that if Jesus came full of both grace and truth, as we read in the gospel of John, that should be our approach. And I'm personally praying as your pastor, because I know I don't always get that right. I'm personally praying, God, would you show me how to represent that, like the fullness of both grace and truth, the tension that oftentimes is between those. Will you show me how to represent that in both how I live and how I lead. I hope that this is becoming a place for you where we can come and kind of have a refuge from the chaos that oftentimes is surrounding us in our culture, that we can come and find redemption for our souls. And regardless of how our story reads, we know that God's not done with us yet. Amen. My hope is that this will continue to be a place where people can come who feel like that, you know what, I I don't know how much longer I want to give the church a chance. I don't know how many more chances I can give to this thing because it keeps, it keeps bringing wounds into my life because we know there's a lot of church hurt out there. And, and I need to let you know, listen to me, like we know that we're not a perfect church. And so if I haven't, if I haven't disappointed you yet, just give me some time. I'll take care of that. Like, but I do hope with time. Listen to me. I do hope with time. Whether you've been coming for a long time, maybe it's your first time, I do hope with time that you'll continue to trust me, that hopefully I can build that trust with you to be your pastor. I'm truly honored to be called pastor. I know it's a huge responsibility and I'm gonna do my very best to lead us in the direction of Jesus. I'm gonna do my very best to make sure that as each week passes by and month and year that we are doing everything we can to resemble more of what Jesus looks like and less of what we should look like or what we think we want to look like. And so if you'll trust me with that responsibility, I wanna let you know that I'll do everything in my power to lead us in that direction, that I'm going to encourage you, I'm going to love you, I'm going to, at times, if necessary, even correct you. And then when I need to, I'm going to confess to you And you may be thinking like, why are you saying this? Are you about to bring forward a big confession? No, I'm not. I just want to let you know that all of what I just said is important to me because listen, I love you. I really do. I love being the pastor of this church. I'm honored to be the pastor of this church. And throughout this series, some of you are going to feel encouraged. Some of you are going to feel challenged. Some of you might feel like you need to be corrected in some of your thinking but I want to let you know it's all coming from a posture and a position of love. Today, we kick off a new series called Lines. We're going to be in it over the next five weeks. And I'm encouraged to see how God uses it, uh, but I know it's going to be challenging. At times, it's going to be maybe difficult. Some things may be difficult to hear at times. And so uh, my hope is that I've built enough relational equity with you that you will allow me to enter into that fray with you. I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to jump in. God, thank you so much for this morning. God, thanks for the opportunity to come and gather in your name. Today, we gather in agreement, which means we know that your power and your presence is made more available. God, I pray that you would use my voice today to communicate truths from your word, that where necessary, there, should be, there can be some correction and some encouragement and all from a posture and position of love. So God, I pray that you would meet us in this moment. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, how many of you have ever had to give or you've received the DTR? Anybody? 
Some of you are like, what's the DTR? It's, of course, define the relationship, right? And usually you have to either give or receive the DTR because you are looking at the relationship differently, right? right? Maybe one person has expectations that are different from the other person's expectations, or maybe you thought that it should have looked this way when they thought it should have looked this way, or maybe there were some boundaries that started to be crossed. You're like, whoa, 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 we need to define the relationship, Well, throughout this series, we're not going to DTR, we're actually going to DTL, and that stands for Define the Line. Now, I probably don't need to spend that much time explaining to you that we need to define some lines in our faith. The further that we get into a world that is drastically moving away from Jesus and challenging those who claim his name, um, it's probably going to become even more and more urgent, and I'll use that word intentionally, It's going to become more and more urgent that we define some lines when it comes to the context of our faith, that we define some lines that we know that God would never want us to cross. And since most of us are like the rest of us, here's my guess. Since most of us are like the rest of us, my guess is that you have been a part of a situation, uh, maybe recently even, and something was said, something was done, maybe something was asked of you, maybe even in the occupation that you have, And you were wondering like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I feel like this is challenging who Jesus wants me to be. I feel like this is challenging a posture and a position that I need to stand firm on because of who God has called me to be. And so if that's ever happened to you, I wanna let you know that this series, I hope and I believe will be incredibly beneficial. Just like I mentioned last week, one of the main objectives of my life and my um my being your pastor, is that I want to educate you, equip you, and empower you to stand firm where you live, work, and play. And so to get us to where I want to go today, I want to look at a particular passage. And uh, actually, before I get there, um, let me jump back to something really quick. I've almost passed something up. One of the things that happens when We find ourselves in those positions, in those experiences where it's like, hey, hey, something's happening. Something was said, something was done. I'm being asked to do something and we're not sure what to do because we just don't have the words, like the words escape us. And so the easiest thing to do is just stay silent, right? You've been there. The easiest thing to do is just stay silent because silence, silence is always the safe bet, isn't it? But is that what Jesus had in mind in Luke 9.23, when he says, hey, if you want to follow me, like if you want, this is serious, like if you really want to devote your life to me and become one of my disciples, then I'm going to ask you to deny yourself, pick up your own cross, which means make your own sacrifices, whatever those need to look like, and follow me every single day. Does that sound safe to you? I want to show you how the message paraphrase grasps what Jesus says in Luke 9, 23. I think it's incredibly intriguing. He says it this way. Then Jesus told them what they could expect for themselves. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I don't, I am, sorry. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way. My way, defining yourself, your true self. What good would it do to get everything that you want but lose you, the real you? If any of you is embarrassed with me and the way that I'm leading you, know that the Son of Man will be far more embarrassed with you when he arrives in all his splendor in company with the Father and the holy angels. And so maybe you're here right now and you've been coming for a long time. Maybe you've been coming for a few times. Maybe this is your first time, but you know that this would represent you at least to some extent. You've been playing it safe. Maybe it's where you live. Maybe it's where you work. Maybe it's where you play, but to some extent, this would represent an aspect of your life, specifically in the context of faith. You've just been playing it safe because there's been times, right? I don't need to convince you of this. There's been times where you know, man, I should have said something. And sometimes you walk away from those situations and you feel like your silence actually affirms something that you didn't want to affirm. And again, we could all just agree right now. We can all kind of just come together and find some empathy in this because we've all done this. 
Because the safe bet is playing it, playing it, or, um, to play it safe, that's the safe bet, right? It's always the safe bet just to be silent. But is that what God has asked us to do when he said, follow me? I've got several things that I hope to accomplish throughout this series that once we get on the other end of it, that you would be able to walk away. And there's a few things that I really hope all of us will feel a little bit more confident in. One of the things would be kind of what we're going to accomplish today in a broader sense, and that is defining lines, defining necessary lines that we know that we don't need to cross. And so I'd love for you to kind of adopt that language, just DTL. Like, hey, here's another area of my life where I need to DTL. I need to define the line. Hey, here's another relationship. Hey, we need to DTL. We need to define the line. I hope that you would adopt that because I can assure you there are all kinds of areas in our lives where we need to DTL. We need to define some lines. But another thing that I would hope to accomplish throughout this series is to give you some language that you can fall back on. Some language that would build some confidence in you when you find yourself in those situations where you're like, man, I'm not sure what to say. I just feel like I should say something, because the last thing you want to do is leave somebody with silent affirmation on something that you know that doesn't represent you and it doesn't represent the God that you worship. And so to get us to where I want us to go today, I do want us to look at a passage that we're going to revisit several times throughout this series in Romans chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles with you, feel free to open them up or turn them on. And we're going to jump into Romans chapter 12 and Paul begins that with this statement. He says, therefore, now we need to pause. And if we want to be good students of the Bible, as soon as we read that statement, therefore, we know that this adverb is showing us that Paul was probably just talking about something else, which leads him to say the rest of this stuff. So we should probably jump back into Romans chapter 11. And remember that when the Bible was written, it didn't have chapters and verses. We added those later. So whatever he said, Uh, before that is going to read seamlessly. So let's jump back in chapter 11 to see what Paul said that he's using the therefore to transition with. Here's what he said. He says, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything, everybody say everything. Everybody say everything. For everything comes from him and exists by his power. For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. And again, seamlessly jumping back into Romans 12. Therefore, in other words, therefore, since God gives us every, like everything comes from him and all things were meant for his glory. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, God, this is your body that you have given me for a little bit of time. How do you want to use it? Offering our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Paul says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but, that's a big but, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, another big transitional word. In other words, until that happens, then this next thing won't happen. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And once again, I want to jump over to the message paraphrase on that one statement in verse two. I love how it says it. It says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. There's so much that I want to unpack in this particular verse, which is why we're going to revisit it over the next few weeks. But for our time today, I want to stay focused on just a few things when it comes to Romans chapter 12. So let me say it this way, and I'm going to say it strongly. This verse, this verse, is where I see so many Christians live or die. If you don't see the significance in the importance of following through on what Paul is telling us here. I promise you, and I don't use that word flippantly, I promise you, your spiritual life will suffer. See, Paul's telling us that, listen, if we want to experience the transforming of our mind and our thoughts and start to see things differently, then you can't conform to the pattern of this world. 
And the more that you conform to the pattern of this world, the less that you're going to have the transformation of mind, helping you to see things in a completely different lens. Because I promise you, God wants you to see something or see most things, like process through life completely differently, oftentimes than what this world wants you to process life or how this world wants you to process through life. And I don't want to stay focused on the negative aspect of this because listen to me, this is a beautiful, a beautiful promise, church. A beautiful promise. The transforming of our minds, leading us to know God's will for our life with more clarity means that God is willing to give us higher levels of peace and higher levels of purpose if we don't conform to the pattern of this world. A higher level of peace because we do begin to process through life differently. We begin to see the circumstances around us differently. We remember, as Paul tells us in Philippians, that we are citizens of heaven, which means we know that the pain and the suffering in our life is temporary and we have an eternal gift waiting us where we get to experience life with Jesus where there is no pain, there is no suffering, there are no more problems. And we get to to have more focus, let me say that different, we get to have a higher level of clarity. We get to have a higher level of clarity on God's purpose for our life. Has anybody ever been confused about their purpose? I have. But when we don't conform to the pattern in this world and we allow our minds to be transformed, clarity on purpose is elevated and we begin to see what God really wants for our lives and how he wants to use our life and our little bit of time and our little bit of opportunity. But we have to know, like you have to know, even though that's an incredible promise that we get to stand on, the enemy of that promise is really clear. The enemy of that promise of allowing our minds to be transformed is conforming to the pattern of this world. Last week, I made a strong statement and I'd like to repeat it this morning. If you've never defined lines, of what it looks like to conform to the pattern of this world, then you've likely already crossed those lines. But I'm not here to give you a guilt trip, so can I just even the playing field really quick? How many of you would raise your hand and say, yep, I know I've crossed lines of conforming to the pattern of this world? Just raise your hand. And for those of you that aren't, you're a liar. And based on what my five-year-old daughter said last night, liars are devils. So there you go. Theology from Madison Pennington right there. Sometimes when we cross that line, like you, you know this, we knew we were crossing the line, right? I mean, we, it, we knew we were crossing the line. We knew that when we stepped over that boundary, when we stepped over into whatever that situation was, when we said that, when we did that, we knew we were crossing that line. And when it's that clear, it's a little bit easier to go back. And as followers of Jesus, hopefully we're still inviting the Holy Spirit to prompt us, to help us to see where we may be deviating and drifting from God's purpose for our life. We can go back and maybe make some adjustments and maybe put some new boundaries in place, maybe define some new lines so that we don't make that compromise again. But other times it's not that clear, is it? I mean, sometimes what happens is we just make a little concession here just a little one here, just small little adjustments along the way. And then just another one here. And before we know it, we find ourselves in situations where we're doing things, saying things, and we kind of wonder, how did I get here? Maybe sometimes we would kind of fall underneath that big umbrella. Well, is, I mean, this is just normal, right? This is what, what normal people do. I mean, every guy does it. Everyone watches it. Most teenagers do it. Hey, I deserve it. Well, as long as they don't mention it, I'm sure they won't miss it. This happens in our personal lives, no doubt, but it happens within our world every single day. And I was introduced to a term this last week that I think represents this really well called creeping normalcy. It's actually a military term. And somebody who goes to our church that used to be in the military introduced me to this. And I think it captures it incredibly well. Here's the definition. Creeping normalcy is a process by which a major change can be accepted as normal and acceptable if it happens slowly through small, often unnoticeable increments of change. The change that could otherwise be regarded as remarkable and objectionable if it took place in a single step or short period. And as this particular gentleman was telling me about this, he was giving me some of his experiences when he was in the military and he used the, and 
He, he used the analogy of what the North Koreans were able to do to the South Koreans. And I want to read it almost exactly the way that he said it, because I thought this was incredibly intriguing. He said that North Korea was able to attack South Korea, and they did so over an extended period of time where they just, by small increments, continued to move their hardened artillery just a little bit closer to the demilitarized zones. And with time, South Korea and its capital was well within range. And once everyone figured out how high the threat had become, the common question was, how did this happen? How did this happen? And the answer was slowly, over time, until we woke up one day and everyone noticed that the threat was at an all-time high. It's pretty amazing if you think about it, what we've come to accept these days, isn't it? Maybe you've been a part of conversations where you've uttered those words too. Hey, how did, how did we get here? Can I give you one example? And I've, I've challenged our church with this in the past, but it's been a while, so many of you will be hearing this for the first time. We can pull out a little device today. We know it as your phone. We can pull out a little device and we can start scrolling and in a period of moments, seconds, <laughs> look, at that. look at that cute little puppy. Look at that little puppy. Oh, look what Johnny's doing. Oh, man. Oh, wow, 17 missionaries were kidnapped in Haiti. Do you see how quick, if we're not careful, we can become desensitized to what's actually taking place around this church? I mean... You don't have to pay that much attention to see how Hollywood and television and radio and education and universities and social media are assuming us into a position to not just accept certain things, but to affirm them. If you want a good book to read, I'd encourage you to pick up The Coddling of the American Mind. It's not even a Christian book, but in this particular book, they challenge this notion of how we have become so desensitized to what's happening around us that it's absurd what's happening on college university campuses these days. And these aren't even believers. And they're talking about it, making an argument for it. It's a great book if you want to pick it up. And so maybe your response and my response should be, well, then what do we do? What do, what do we do? DTL. We define some lines. We define some lines. My hope is that you would leave here today and be able to use some of that language. Maybe it would even be a prompting for somebody else to feel some conviction where they need to feel some conviction. In other words, maybe you've got some friends and maybe they're not your church friends, maybe they're, they're other friends. And you know, when you're around them, you may have a tendency more often to maybe make some compromises or concessions. And maybe they go to do something here recently that you're a part of and you're like, you know what? I'm gonna have to bow out this time. Wait, well, hey, what's going on with you, man? What's going on? Man, I'm, I'm feeling really convicted these days that I just, I just need to define some lines in my faith. I just needed to find some lines in my faith. Maybe you need to do that in your marriage relationship where it's like, hey, we need to define some lines of what this should look like if we want to try to grow towards a place of health. Maybe you need to do that in your dating relationship. Maybe you need to do that in your occupation. And before we're done today, listen to me. I want to pray for our public educators. Uh, you may not know this about me. I was a school teacher for three years. I believe to be a public educator today is probably one of the hardest jobs that you can have. And if you're a teacher in here, I want to let you know that you've got my prayer support, but you've also got my attention. If you ever want to sit down and talk through like anything that's kind of coming at you, like, hey, how do I stand firm here? I did this with uh, a medical professional last week. I think the medical professions uh, are go going to be uh, even more challenging as well to be able to stand firm, at, stand firm at times and know, man, I can't cross that line. I know that's not who Jesus has called me to be. And I know that can get challenging. So I want to let you know that I'm available. I'll help you process through that. I don't have all the answers, but hopefully I have a couple. Uh, hopefully I have a few things that I could help encourage you with as you try to stand firm where you live, where you work, and where you play. And by, by the way, if there's another occupation that I'm not thinking of where it's like, hey, I've, like, this is what I do and I'm constantly being bombarded with these challenges of what I'm supposed to just accept and sometimes not just accept but affirm, I'm available, okay? I'm available. And I'll do everything I can to help 
to equip you and educate you and empower you to stand firm where you live, work, and play. So let's end on a really, really practical note because all of us, listen to me, all of us, let's even the playing field, have at least one line that we didn't need to define more clearly. All of us. We all have at least one line that we need to define more clearly. So to kind of get the juices flowing, let me give you a few up here on the screen. What should you watch? Like, have you ever defined that line? Have you ever looked right before you watch a movie if it says sexual content or nudity? I do. Like, I promise you there's other lines that I crossed, but this is one I defined a long time ago. We'll look at the rating of a particular movie if it says sexual content or nudity, we're out. It's a line we define. Maybe you should think about this one if you're a parent. What should your kids watch? Have you ever defined those lines for them? How about technology for yourself and your kids? Like how much is too much screen time? Six hours? Eight hours? Uh, And again, just another reminder, make sure you come tonight. That's for everybody And this will be an incredibly educational time for those of you that are parents. And again, this is for everybody, not just parents. uh, But Emily and I are going to get up and give you just three action steps that we've put in place even recently because we were very convicted by this documentary. Uh, Three action steps that we're putting in place that we think will create better boundaries. What's acceptable in what your kids are being taught at school before you get involved? Have you ever defined that line? How about when your, occup- your occupation is asking you to go against your faith? We just talked about that. What about your dating relationship? Like before you actually start dating, do you think it would be wise? I think it would be. I think it would be wise to define the lines and the boundaries that you're not willing to cross so that you don't have to have the DTR later, right? That's full circle. See what I did there? I'm gonna pray for us and here's what I want us to do. I want us to get, I want us to spend some serious time with God And if necessary, and I would encourage it, I want you to write down what that line needs to be, or at least the category, dating, technology, movies, or whatever else it could be. And so as we go into this time of response, can I encourage you like to make this real? My hope is that we walk out those doors a little bit different every single week. And I promise you, your due diligence behind this, your intentionality behind this of defining that line, let's just make it one today if necessary. What does that need to be for you? Because you know, man, if I define that one, man, if I would just define that one with a little bit more clarity, I know that it would keep me from conforming to the pattern of this world, which means I'm allowing God's transformation to take over my mind, which leads me to a higher and greater levels of peace and greater levels of clarity on God's purpose for me. Do you want that? Because I want that for you. I want that for you. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna transition into a time of response. Lord Jesus, we've all done it. We've all conformed. We've all made concessions. We've all stepped over the lines. And God, I pray that you would remind us both of your grace, knowing that you've forgiven us. You don't want us to walk with shame or guilt. You don't want that stuff hanging over us. You came to remove that from us but you also want to make sure that your truth is represented. And that passage that Paul just gave us in Romans, I don't think it could get any more clear. So God, would you convict us in this moment that wherever we're, God, I'd say it this way, whatever line that we're crossing that's leading us to the most conformity, God, would you challenge that within us? Would you remind us that you wanna partner with us, that you're not asking us to do anything that you're not willing to partner with us to help us to do. And so God, we're inviting that partnership. We need that partnership. We need the power of Jesus to help us as we're trying to discover what that looks like, to define those lines. So God, as we enter into this time, I just pray that you would meet us, that this would be a thin space where we feel just a little bit closer to you So we pray this in Christ's name, amen.